and welcome to the Awaken to Wholeness Summit. I'm Val Salidkar. Today, we are blessed to have a beautiful speaker with us, someone who embodies mindfulness in his life, his work, and all the ways that he shows up with his gifts in this world, Dr. Michael Brandt DeMaria. He's an integrative psychologist, poet, author, speaker, musician. He has over three decades of experience helping to guide others on their life journey. He's also a meditation mindfulness yoga teacher who integrates creativity in the healing process. Michael is the best-selling author of several books on prose and poetry. His latest best-selling book, Peace Within, Clear Your Mind, Open Your Heart, Embrace Your Soul, and Heal Your Life. He's also an award-winning playwright and four-time Grammy nominee. Michael! <laughs> Wow. So many beautiful gifts that you bring to our world. It's such a blessing to have you with us. Thank you. It's it's a blessing to be here with you. You know, I'm a big fan of you and your work as well. <laughs> Contact. So thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Absolutely. I think it's 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 so beautiful how I think maybe a decade ago, you know, you reached out to me and I had a project called The Voice of the Earth. And you were working on a song or project of the voice of the earth. And it brought us together into our awareness. And like this peripheral journey for us began. And we really recognized that how the poetic language of life has claimed us yes. in so many similar ways. So it's really beautiful to finally come and collaborate and come together for this, this summit. Yes, like, long, long overdue, long overdue. So I'm thrilled that we're, it's finally happening. Me too, me too. So you have such an extensive background. You've done so many different things, the music and the writing and this beautiful poetry and your psychology, you know, bringing all that creativity into holding and healing and helping us recognize and integrate all that's within us. And I'd love to know a little bit about how your journey has unfolded and brought all of those elements together and this beautiful dance, this beautiful synergy in your life. So, well, you know, this usually goes back to our childhood, and, and for me, it's no exception. You know, for me, that moment uh, when music, creativity, spirituality, and healing came together um, was as a result of healing from surgery trauma as, as a young boy. I had a number of surgeries, um, and this one in particular, which was abdominal surgery, I was six, seven years old, and at the time, you know, I look back on it because I was trained as a child and adolescent psychologist, and it just blows my mind still to this day that at the time, their, their idea was, you know, you don't want to stress the kid, so don't tell them they're going to have surgery until the day of surgery, which is insane. I mean, we know this today that that's insane, Absolutely. Um, but that happened to me twice, and, and, and yeah, six and at seven, you know, my mom would pick me up from school and, and I'd, you know, I thought something was like a special day. I was, you know, getting out of school early and then the bag was packed. It's like, well, we're going to the hospital. And I was like, what? Um, so that sense of, you know, betrayal um, also was then compounded by uh, that surgery I had a near death like experience. I've never been able to confirm that I, it was actually a near-death experience, but at least psychologically it was. And I remember leaving my body during the surgery, going someplace and not being thrilled to come back into this body that was racked with pain, 210 stitches in my abdominal area in a, in a children's ward where there were screaming kids and kids without limbs. And, and so I was very disconnected from my body. I, I was kind of floating outside of my body and I was very, um, depressed. I wasn't happy about being back in my body. I wasn't really happy with my parents. I wasn't happy with my brothers who were very sympathetic. Um, I was a highly sensitive kid. I didn't talk much. I was painfully shy, um, deeply introverted. And I felt very lost, very alone, very disconnected from my body, from the people around me, from reality. I mean, I felt like I wasn't real. 
you know, I felt like a, a spirit or ghost, or I, I just, I wasn't, I was traumatized. Um, and experience from, from a native point of view would be called soul loss, which I know you'd be familiar with. So I found myself being gravita gravitating towards the family piano. And I, I was always thrilled that there was a piece of furniture in the house that made noise. I had no lessons at this point in time. But I just remember going to stand or sit by the piano and I would just hit one note at a time. You know, just like my keyboard here. I always have a keyboard or flute pretty close to something to make music pretty close by. And I'd hit that note vowel and I'd hear that sound and then I loved listening it dissipate off into silence. And as it dissipated off into silence, I felt something inside give way and it was like it took me to that same place I remember in my near-death-like experience where I felt peace and oneness and and that was the connection I was seeking and I would do that like over and over again. I lift my hand and then boom it was kind of like doing Tai Chi piano I was like boom I'm and feeling this with you as you're sharing the story it's very powerful and of course, my, my parents generally thought I might be autistic, you know, because I would sit there and just do the self-soothing, you know, I was self-soothing or, or they call it um, self-stimulation or STEM, you know, when you watch kids who with Asperger's. And I definitely, at, least, at the very least, had Asperger's. But I was also, it was something deeper than that. I mean, for me, it was, I was putting myself into a trance in a way. I was, I was actually practicing sound healing without having any idea what it was. was. It was centering my consciousness. It was dissolving my um, sense of physical pain. Um, it was allowing me to connect to these sound waves that were taking me to this other realm, or, I, or perhaps we should say the real realm, right? I mean, the, the infinite uh, yes. spacious vibration that is, I like to say the hum of God, right? Um, ohm, whatever. So ever since then, this is this is every time I reached very deep dark times in my life music saved me music brought me back from the brink um, and and so I call it my holy trinity which is nature spirituality and creativity and and these th things just weave themselves in and out of of everything I do so I really don't feel like I'm doing a lot of things I feel like I'm doing one thing in many different ways Absolutely. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. What a powerful story and a, and a powerful reminder, you know, of that, that thing that never changes within us at such a young age for you to tap into that space. And I, and I imagine too, then how that trauma must have stayed with you through your life as you learned, learned more about what it was and how it was showing up in its various forms in your life. Yeah. And then how music became like this, this way to come back to home come back to this oh yeah home base or that you know we talk about the tonic note or coming back home you know to that sense of which is great for me because it's never been ego based it's never been identity based about something in form in this world my center from a very early age was something formless mm. vibratory mm -hmm. the blessing in that has been you know, being pretty connected to cosmic consciousness my whole life. The downside of that was like investing in any kind of ego identity and like, you know, feeling that sense of, you know, for me, it's been more of an issue of losing contact with reality, you know, but, you know, it's most of the people I work with, I'm trying to help cure them of the reality of this world. Um, but there's about five, ten, two to five percent of us where the issue is not that <laughs> it's like, you know, being able to stay tethered to this world. So that I'm in that, I'm in that, you know, group, lucky group, uh, which is both a blessing and a curse. I hear you. I know you do. <laughs> I know you do. And I, so I wonder then when you're holding space for people that come, come to see you in your practice as a psychologist, as an integrative psychologist, in, in what ways do you bring that sense, that creativity into your work? So I have, in fact, in, before you get to my consulting room, I have my yoga therapy sound healing room. And also in my, in my consulting room, I have flutes, I've got drums, I've got didgeridoos, I've got crystal bowls. So it, they're, all, they're all there and they're present. So some people though, I mean, it, it is, it, 
a lot of people are drawn to it. They'll ask questions. They're interested in it. Sometimes after a particularly painful sharing, I might play the flute. I might do some music. I do a lot of toning. Um, I've got Tibetan bells. I've, I've got gongs. I have um, different ways to we're practicing either mindfulness or meditation, quieting the mind. But I think it also goes to present moment awareness. So I'm also trained in what's called phenomenological psychology. And, and, and you know, I know you know about this. And it's very similar when we talk about soul work. I don't see people as objects in space, but as um, vibratory patterns that perpetuate themselves, which we also could call a song. Mm, yeah. So each person that comes into my my room, the room changes because of how they're vibrating and where, what they're resonating to. And also that I see them as a world yeah. and, and, and I'm interested in getting to know that world, that, that, that the way they vibrate, the way they um, move through space and time. Mm. And that makes it so fascinating. And, and so, so it's not just the literal use of sound and sound healing, but my framework, my, my way of creating the space for them and interacting with them is based upon seeing them as a song, seeing them more as music than as an object. And, and I'm wanting to help them find the song of their soul because that is, is what heals. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, it does. Of course it does. And what a poetic way to, to see everybody and approach that. It seems to have really been this thing that's informed your life in the way that you come. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it makes life so much more fascinating, you know, because, you know, if you see everybody, it, yeah, I mean, this is the great, this is the great Copernican revolution going on on the planet is, is, is that, you know, the great lie is somehow we are separate from nature and that we are separated objects in space. Yes. And both of them we know with today's quantum physics and, and subatomic physics is that these two things are not true, that everything is deeply interconnected and there are no objects in space. They're simply shifting, changing energy patterns. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is we know this is true, that everything is deeply interconnected. The weird thing is that somehow the human brain is perceiving everything as separate. But for me, that has everything to do with our cultural language system. Absolutely. You know? And in many ways, we're still catching up to what we're learning through science and spirituality and the sense of individuality and how everything is coming together in that seamless whole, you know, in that dance of life or we're interwoven into the fabric of life. You know, we get it. It's like we get it and we know it, but we're not living it. Absolutely. Some of us are. Some of us are really awakening to this and we're, we're starting to act it out, act out this great understanding you know, through the ways that we show up in the world. And yet there is this predominant uh, paradigm, you know, that still drives us in this other direction. Uh, yes, and it goes to the on our world. Yeah, it, it, it's Aristotelian, Newtonian, Cartesian, mechanistic, reductionistic model of the universe as, as a well-oiled machine, as a clockwork. And, and Can you imagine we're, we're still stuck in that? We're <laughs> suffering, suffering under the weight of that. Uh, we we seeing the world as dead, uh, you know, and and nothing as as alive, and and we realize not, you know, that this is not true. You know, I've worked a lot with indigenous healers. I know we've both done, you know, work with Vision Quest work, and these language systems of native people are all about form and transformation. Most of their language systems are very verb based. Um, right. Most Western languages, most civil quote civilized languages are noun based. You know, my Blackfoot teacher, you know, would say, you know, Michael, I can talk Blackfoot almost all week with barely uttering a noun. Right. When you think about that, you know, when you refer, it's like I'm Michaeling, you're they, you know, valling as we're talking, listening, moving through spacing, touching the lighting and moving. So there's it's present moment. You're not going to the past and future. So a language system and a culture is a, is like a software downloaded to our our uh, our brains right when we, when we get incultured and civilized in, in society and, and so we have all these biases you know we it completely creates a veil of what we're going to experience 
So, so it's a huge problem because we don't even have language. We're trying to create new language to talk about these things. And that's why I love music because then I, it's, it is the thing. It sends all of it. It bypasses everything, you know, and gets right in there. It does. It does. And, and that's this beautiful. So here's you with this theme, this overarching theme of your work, the song of the soul, you know, and, and a project that I, a musical project that I had for three years, also I, called the song of the soul. There's another amazing. parallel, right? For I love us. It. I love it. Yes. It's such an invitation for us to, to really explore and experience what that is for each of us in its own unique expression. Right. So what is, how do we experience the song of our soul? Write that. So, so, um, this, yes. yeah, so this beautiful, which 23 years ago, um, mm. I first heard when I first heard this as I was getting preparing for my first Native American vision quest, um, vision fast, um, which is actually uh, kind of a misnomer, the native word actually, um, the Lakota word, Hemla Chiape, literally means the lamentation or the lament, which is much closer to what it really is about. I, the, this is sort of just brought tears to my eyes and it was, it was such a deep, deep kind of um, resonation. And my first flute was made from body, body dimensions, my own body dimensions, like the size of my arm, the first, you know, first hole was by you know, my, my first hand size and then my thumb size. So it's like made according to your body. And then I said, well, you know, cause I played keyboards and, and percussion growing up and when I said well how do I play this how do I what would it you know how do I make this music that is bringing tears to my eyes I said well I don't want you to play for anybody for a year and play only at night outside and listen for the song of your soul mm. and I that that brought tears to my eyes um, and the idea is that um, very similar to Af most indigenous cultures the African cultures, the Australian Aboriginal cultures, they believe music is everywhere around us. A musician doesn't create anything, they're a channel. Yes. And so the idea of humbling yourself and, and going into a place of darkness and with this instrument and, and deeply listening to what wants to come through you. And when you find that song of your soul, the two sides of it are that number one, it will tell you where you come from, mm. why you're here, what you're here to do, and where it is you're going. Mm. Um, the other side of it is the Lakota has the story that it's also a courting flute, that your soul song will only attract will attract your, you know, soul mate. Um, and we actually created, I actually wrote, co-wrote a whole play based upon that Lakota legend called Shia, Siatanka, mm. uh, sometimes pronounced Shiatanka, um, which is, documents that story. We took a few paragraph myth and turned it into a 90 page screenplay and, and, and had a 30 person production staff. It was beautiful. Amazing. But coming back to how do you do that? And let's say if you don't have a flute, and you want to do that. What is the song of your soul? It is that which brings you alive. It is that which gives you energy. It is that which is most instinctual, natural, and effortless for you. My story is a metaphor for something we all have inside of us, and it doesn't have to be a flute. I know I have some friends who are high-level mathematicians, and their soul song is high-level mathematics. I love that you're saying this. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's what, what brings you alive. Yes. What Mm. What brings you alive? What arouses your heart? So beautiful, absolutely. What yeah. brings your heart to life? That's you... that's it. And and the other, I love this idea of what is most natural, instinctual, and effortless for you. Yes, yes. That's your soul song on the planet. When do you lose track of time? When do you drop into flow? Because then you are being sung by Creator, doing what it is you came here to do. It is your greatest joy. And it's your soul work. Your soul song is your soul work. It is your soul print. It is your soul gift you're here to give to your people. And this great invitation that's happening, that's always happening. And right now in this moment, right here, as we are here, as everyone's tuning in, as we're all together, is for all of us to take the time 
to be so deeply present in whatever ways we need to be to listen deeply to what is calling us, what is claiming us, what wants to have us and, and present itself through us. And that is how we live the most meaningful, most alive, thriving experience in our lives. That's beautiful. That's, that's exactly it. That's it. it. That's, we're all being invited into that. And if we really want to be in our wholeness, be in our fullness, this is it. Listen mm -hmm. to it. Honor it. Become it. That is, that is the truth of our lives mm -hmm. right that's there. It. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Beautifully yes. said. Now. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it really means, many times actually, it means allowing ourselves to be broken open. Oh, and absolutely. Whatever the, it is the experience that we're having and this moment is calling for a, a lot of heartbreaking wide open in this moment, you know? And, and I would love for us to also talk right now about the value of allowing ourselves to be broken open in this moment to discover what's alive inside of us. Absolutely, well, the two, two native uh, uh, proverbs come to me and one is, don't trust anyone until their heart has been broken mm -hmm. because that is the origin of compassion and wisdom. Mm -hmm. The other one is the soul would have no rainbow if the eyes had no tears. Mm -hmm. So a broken heart is an open heart and the soul this, this is very key. I'm so glad you brought it up. The doorway to the soul is the heart. The gate to the soul is the heart. And you cannot open the gate of the heart without it being broken open. Our gifts, this is another native understanding, our gifts don't come in spite of the, the wound. The gifts come through the wound. The gifts are born through the heart breaking open. It's a seed. It's like a seed that has to be open. I now I'm thinking of Leonard Cohen just to bring him into this in this moment. Uh, right? Leonard, Crack yeah. it everything, and that's how the light gets in. That's it. That's it. So I, you know, I I met him at the Grammys when he got his Lifetime Achievement Award just a few years ago, and this man had us all captivated by he 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 recited one of his songs as a poem. And you know, he just leapt up those stairs. I mean, he's like 78, 79 at the time. And that man, you know, poet, monk, singer, yeah. paradoxical being. I'm telling uh, you. That man, wow. Yes. What an inspiration. So yes, that's how the light gets in. That's exactly right. And it's how the light gets out. Yes. As well as in. As well as in. And it's also that's it's a sweet romance with darkness, which is something that we I think in our society we tend to want to run from run from what feels scary, what, run from what feels, you know, what feels impossible. Difficult, to difficult. difficult um, right? Jesus, I, never, Jesus never said, blessed are the comfortable. <laughs> you know, that was, that's not in the Beatitudes. Um, and, you know, so we have this, it's a tremendous shadow. Part of our shadow is, is Americans. Part of America's shadow is this pursuit of happiness, this expectation of happiness. Um, the world was not designed for us to be happy or comfortable. It's designed to wake us up. Mm. You can get that. Into that. that. That will shift everything because otherwise, you know, everything looks like... Um, an obstacle to your happiness as opposed to a vehicle for your awakening. Beautifully said, beautifully yeah. said. And so there it is, right? You know, whatever it is that we're experiencing, it's about embracing that. Welcoming it in. As I'm thinking now, Rumi, the guest house, which I actually just mentioned in another interview, but it's coming up again. Here it is. Like these things are going to appear, which is to embrace everything that's within us and allow it to allow, allow it to become a, a guide, a teacher, you know, into what's possible for us. As Rilke says, let everything happen to you. Let everything happen to you. Mm. Um, let all sorrows ripen within me. I mean, there's a million ways and quotes and poems that we can dive into that say this, you know, that are, that are coming from that space, that song of the collective soul. And, and part of this, you know, one of the things that's different about, um, is, it, is it permissible to, to, to mention my, my new book? Yes, please, please do. Please so, do. What, what's different about this is because a lot of mindfulness meditation practices don't deal real well with emotion and feeling. And, and feeling, what we're talking about here, this fertile darkness that 
one of the things I really try to bring to this, and I know you do too, we both have a real interest in deep ecology, we both have an interest in, you know, in indigenous wisdom traditions, um, as well as meditation mindfulness, that, that, that when we really allow feeling without conceptualization and really allow feeling to move through us like a song, like an energy, and be curious as opposed to be judgmental. Yes, curiosity. Yeah, we're so head people, we're so judgmental in our Western culture that we, we spend most of our time repressing or acting out emotion or feeling as opposed to cradling it almost like a crystal ball and see what it's here to teach us. Mm-hmm. So this idea of working with feeling as energy patterns moving through us. So if you look at it as like notes in a song mm. as opposed to, oh, I don't want that. You're pushing away the unpleasant, grasping at the pleasant. This is where suffering comes in. So this idea of colors, textures, um, notes of our emotional life really allow us to feel um, the fullness of the song of our soul. And that's where, you know, this poem I've mentioned, you know, before to you, the original voice, which starts off, each moment is a note in the song of today. Will you share this poem with us? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Let's get the full experience of it. Right, let me see if I can do it with it. Each moment is a note in the song of today, rising and playing the many voices of me, intermingling with being. The hum of God is the canvas, and the sounds come full formed as if echoing the place from which they come. So this idea of of the just it's a guest house right i mean that that these emotions these feelings um are are an echo of from the other side they're 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 energy trying to get through trying to be awakened yes you know what's interesting was coming to me in this moment i'm thinking about even a personal experience when i was younger where i did a lot of writing like like early teens, you know, in this time, I have a million journals throughout my life, but just when I was just really getting started in that, I would sit sometimes and, you know, we're just discovering all of this and I would, I would look for the pain. I would look for the fear. I would look for the sadness. I would look, I would, I would like call for it. Like, I want, please come. Like, I want to feel you. I want to feel that, that, invitation to break open i want to feel the the caress of the tears on my face and like from that space let this inspiration pour through That's you know good. and yeah. there's a point where i realize it doesn't always have to come from that but in the beginning i was always like oh, where is that where is that it was like my, my opening <laughs> yeah well i'm i'm the same we're ed, what i call edge walkers we're drawn to that edge you know it's like that's and but that's is where life is lived and yes. and we probably you know that's something we share i'm always wearing black you know part of that is because of the soul um has an awareness and that you know in the medicine wheel for for native people the west is is this place of sunset autumn fall it's also the area of the 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 element of water which flows down which is like emotion and feeling. And that is, that is the direction of the soul. The soul, in fact, a lot of people think of the soul as, as air or breath because you know it's synonymous with that in a lot of languages. But soul comes from the Nordic word sul, which meant of the water. Mm. So I see the soul as you know, watery and, and the windows of the soul feeling mm. and uh, the imaginal, uh, which is very much connected to the creative again. So this idea of, of deep feeling and, and welcoming these difficult emotions, not bad, but difficult emotions is the place of soul um, because they tell you where you're missing soul. To Native people, their word for depression is soul loss or be dispirited. So, you know, when you were down or there was no food or no water, um, what did you do? You dance you sang, you, you did ceremony. So in our culture, you think that you do, you know, it's, it's actually Maslow's pyramid is upside down. You know, it's, you get your food, you get all this and do this. And then if you get all these other things, take care of, oh, then you can create and be interested in being. And, 
you know, for Native people, these people lived harsh lives, difficult lives. They, their creativity and their spirituality was the bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. You did that when you didn't have anything else because it brought your soul back. When you were traumatized, you sang, you, you listened to your dreams, you painted your dreams on your teepee. Mm -hmm. These people understood that, that the language of the soul, the song of the soul, is what is foundational to life. It is not some kind of superfluous dessert on top of a mechanistic s success. So anyway, no, sorry, I get a little bit on my soapbox. <laughs> I, I want to be on the soapbox right now. <laughs> you are. Like, ah, this is the sacred activism. This, yeah. is, this is what's coming through. Well, it is because be, it is being cultural change agents and everybody out there listening to us, um, this is, this is an illness in our culture. We live in a egocentric, extroverted, thinking, soulless society. Yes, and we need to be moving towards a soul-centric society that recognizes this first. So I love how you're, you know, recognizing to flip that pyramid. You know, like we really need to come into ourselves, and that that's how we're invited to then step up and become participants on a much larger level. It can yeah. only come through our sense of wholeness, our sense of connection to this this ever-present calling that's within us and shifting this paradigm to 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 to, to confront the, these big lies that our culture our, our dominant mother culture has has mm -hmm. their viruses that we see right now are, are destroying the planet destroying relationships destroying ourselves mm -hmm. um, you know that uh i love that line in james taylor you've got a friend which is they'll take your soul if you let them don't let them um so you you've you have to care for your soul and nobody else will if you don't. And it is listening to what brings you alive, what arouses your heart, what feeds your heart. Mm -hmm. I can ask people of any walk of life, any demographic, what feeds your soul and what poisons your soul? And they, I don't say anything else. I'm not talking about soul in any religious context. People get it. Yeah. And they understand the soul at a very day-to-day -day wow. common sense level. Well, let's, so let's dive into that. So in, in your book, Peace Within, that you just showed us, right? You have a chapter on peace within the soul. Yes. A chapter on peace within the self, right? So let's talk about that because we do, we use these words and we, we use them a lot of times without really coming together with a, a, a meaning that we can agree upon. So when you say soul, when you say self, when we talk about ego, what does that mean? What are, what are, let's define all of those things right now. Great question. Um, and I've got some cool diagrams in the book, but I'll try to, to say it simply. Um, but the diagram is, is very helpful. Uh, I should have brought one. I could hold it up. But basically, the ego is a child of society. Okay, you don't come in with an ego. You think of each one of us when we're first born. We don't know a language. We don't know our name. We can't maneuver through a social landscape. But would we say we don't exist? No. We'd actually say when you're, you, you see very hard adults holding an infant. Complete really, presence. Pure presence, right? They're all soul, no ego. Mm. So the soul is our foundation again, this sense of pure presence. The soul is a child of nature. And the soul is radically unselfconscious. The soul lives from the inside out. Mm. And and that's that's our essence. It's We could think of it as your, our essential self. When I use the word self, I'm, meeting, I'm talking about the meeting point, the mediating place that mediates the ego and the soul. Mm. And we actually have many different ego identities. You know, like I have, you know, father, I have husband, I have a psychologist, I have musician, you know, I have author. You know, these are different, it's brother. These are different ego identities. We all have these different, different roles. We play. Ego right. is the, the ways that we're carrying out these gifts into the world. Right. Uh, a persona also means a mask or kind of this kind of role we're playing. Mm. I often imagine you could think of it as being, you know, actors on a stage while the soul is the one sitting in the audience really knowing the truth, you know, that, that we go and we play these different roles. But what is the center point? Who is the witness of all these different roles? Mm. So in this, in this diagram, I show how the ego develops through this feedback loop. You know, I do this, my parents smile. I do this, they frown. I do this, my teacher gives me an A. I do this, 
my teachers give me an F. Mm-hmm. I do this. You're allowing yourself to be shaped. Yeah. It's this feedback system, and the ego's main goal is acceptance and approval. Mm. And this is not a bad thing. The ego's not a bad guy. The ego's just a social guy or gal. And that part of us, it helps us maneuver in the social world. And in indigenous cultures, you have the development of an ego, but you don't stop there. Between 15 and 25, you would then have a soul initiation of some sort Mm. where you would drop back down into that original nature another way we can talk about soul is our true nature which would be a buddhist way of talking about it our inner nature Um, we could say you know that soul is a child of nature a child of the universe a child of god however it's a part of us that knows the divine ground of being or that fundamental ground the ego mediates us with society the soul mediates us with the divine ground or with the ultimate ground of being so we can't, if we try to ground ourselves with the ego, we end up neurotic. But we might be really grounded in our soul, but if we don't have an ego to mediate with a culture and communicate to that, we can appear psychotic. Mm. So or I call it soul kosis. <laughs> and <laughs> so it's in my a new book I just finished. It's not going to be out for probably another year. It's called Heart Warrior, um, Birthing Wisdom and Compassion Through the Darkness of Life. Yes. It's, it's what we're talking about. Yeah, they love character. this one. Yeah, it's very soul centric. So, did that help give you kind of an overview of self? Yes. Absolutely. And you know what came up for me too when you're talking about how you know met many cultures and indigenous cultures that we have this sort of you know coming through a threshold from our child into our young adult. Like there's this this moment, and like we. I feel that we are so disconnected from that, especially here in our Western society, where like, let's say people are going through their bar, mit- bar mitzvahs or bat mitzvahs, or they're, they're doing these things that are supposed to represent that, but they are so meaningless in many ways because they don't have any kind of modern context for us. Exactly. So we have to have context. It has to make sense for us. Right. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to share something I'm doing that because I feel so strongly, I have a, I have a two year old, you know, and I didn't give him, we didn't, we, me, I, my husband and I, we didn't give him a middle name because it's this forethought about, you know, creating something powerful for him to step into that is meaningful for him. So around his coming of age, that time, whatever that is for him, he'll take a year to explore his name wow. because there's a power in that. Can you wow. imagine giving yourself your own name? Yes. So cool. And then we're going to create a ceremony that's going to be that sweet 16, that bar mitzvah, that modern with modern context, that's going to be his naming ceremony with the big gathering and the family and the friends and all that beauty where he will announce his name and we will then make that legal as his middle name. And it'll also be a second cord cutting for us to yeah. be able to step back and let him now take responsibility in this new way. He's so, very fortunate. Very fortunate. <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, and that's exactly how the vision quest worked. Um, yes. The idea was that between 15 and early 20s, you would actually become he or she who was formerly known as Michael or she was formerly known as Val, and, and you'd go out into the wilderness. And the idea is our soul print is as unique, it's just like your soul song is unique and individual as your thumbprint. And your inner nature would be drawn to part of outer nature, which would mirror your soul qualities back to you. Mm. And that part of nature would call you by your soul name. So actually nature or creator would give you that name. And it was, it's again, it's that same kind of exploration you're creating for your, your son in, in such a beautiful way. And then once you had that name, when you came back to the village, you would be call that name to your parents and they would know you by that name and at that point they would go live separately from you so you miss that whole storm and stress of adolescence that we take years to to try to get through in a few weeks soul initiation Um, so it's it's very very powerful what you're doing in in the power of names Mm -hmm. and to have that opportunity is is my hats off to you guys it's an incredibly powerful thing and wonderful foresight and he's going to be very fortunate. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I feel very grateful to have this awareness to be able to provide that for him and his movement into himself, you know, even deeper. And for all of us, you know, we can all do that for ourselves as well, no matter what age we are, you know, it's, it's really not an age based thing. You know, I think that I, I'm thinking about, you know, um, Bill Plotkin's work, 
Yes, good friend. I know you know intimately as well, right? And he talks about this sort of wheel that moves us through different stages in our lives. And he says that most of us are stuck in this sort of adolescence, you know, this young, young. Ended adolescence, yeah. Right. This concentric wheel of development, yes. Exactly. So we haven't yet moved into our young adulthood or our adulthood, you know, and his soul craft is that journey into that space of any age for any of us. And that so much of our world is stuck in this, this phase of life without moving into that next phase and how crucial that is for us to then sort of, in a sense, graduate into ourselves, graduate into becoming an elder, you know, truly it's like, you know, just being 85 doesn't make you an elder, you know, the wisdom of life that moves you into eldership, that, that is what brings the great wisdom that we continue to pass on, that legacy, that evolutionary legacy. You can become older without becoming elder, <laughs> is exactly right, which is the huge problem in our culture. I mean, huge problem. As Robert Bly said, we live in a sibling society. You know, we've almost lost the capacity for, because if you don't have initiated adults, you're not going to have elders. So, you know, until people get initiated into this deeper level of, of, of their soul, that deeper mystery, that mysterious essential center of who they are, which is an orienting point to find out what is your gift to give to your people, it's very hard to then develop into, you know, Bill talks about you, you, you move into the sage, which is you're no longer performing your soul work, your presence is your soul work. Mm, absolutely. Your presence becomes your gift. And, and that takes a lot of ripening, a lot of seasoning, a lot of burning, a lot of purification of the ego um, over a lifetime. Um, to, uh, of, of, and, you know, every religious tradition has some form of this. The Christians talk about the emptying of the self. The Buddhists talk about the emptying of the self in different ways and different language. But it is about service and, and you know, having the ego polished and so the soul can emerge. The, Jung talked about it as the ego is knocked out of the center of gravity of the self. You're not getting rid of the ego, but you're moving it out of the center of gravity of the self. So the soul becomes the center of gravity of the self. And then you realize that you're here for service and, and to give and to, to bear the fruit you came to bear for your people. The mm-hmm. gifts are not for you, they're for, for your people. Yes, yes, and yes. And that is why, like, i you know, many times I find when I, I do a lot of public speaking and I, and, and especially group work, I do a lot of group work and I find people are afraid to own their gifts. Let's say that Absolutely. they know what's there, but they don't want to speak it out because they feel like they're going to be egotistical or they're going to be, people are going to see them as this, right? So they get very attached to that story, that idea, and they start burying them down, 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 down. And they're craving this permission to to live in who the the space of who they are in the most honest raw authentic vulnerable way and when they get that permission which often comes with my raw on my soapbox right we're like yes because it is ultimately selfish to keep those gifts buried inside of us and tragic the thing we can do is to say here i am here are my gifts here is how i am in service to the world and to own that and that is, that is what is service is all about. It's about really coming into who we are, being able to announce that passionately into the world and be that in the world. And that right there is everybody that's listening, it's your permission to own your gifts and to announce them because it is the most radical way that we can serve the world is just by being who we are fully. Yes. And that's how we belong to the world is by being fully who we are. And and that's beautifully put. And again, because we're in an egocentric culture, people do, they misunderstand that. It took me a long time, you know, being so painfully shy and being, you know, I couldn't really even own that I was a musician until I was 42. I didn't get my first Grammy nomination until I was 48. I had barely been owning being a musician and giving away those gifts. And it was a huge turning point for me. And it's interesting because people will still, you know, I will hear this stuff. It's like, you know, oh, Di Maria, he's so arrogant. You know, he list, oh, he's a four-time grand on you. And, and I was like really hurt. You know, I was like, oh man, you know, that's like, and I don't want to be arrogant. I'm, you know, I've always been thought it was kind of pretty humble. And, and then I said, well, let me look at this. Let me look at this. And I read, you know, I looked at the etymology of arrogance and arrogare means to claim one's place. Mm. 
And when I read that, I was like, yeah, all right, I'm being arrogant. I'm it's claiming like, this. I'm about, being claimed and I am claiming. Like, yeah, because it's like, it's, and the difference, be, of course, is, is narcissism or egocentrism right. is you're needing recognition to be okay. Mm-hmm. The soul, we said the ego is interested in acceptance, approval, recognition. The soul is interested in one thing, is that is deep, authentic connection to God, the divine ground, and con- a, as a conduit to sending those gifts out into the world mm-hmm. in a genuine, authentic way. So it's interested in authentic connection, not acceptance and approval. It's a very different thing. So even if everybody thinks I'm crazy, I feel good because I got out what was inside. So, you know, Jung said, if you bring out what is inside of you, it will save you. If you don't, it will kill you or turn into a disease or a symptom or come and meet you in, in a, in a faded way. If you're not living your destiny and destiny, destinare means what is written in the stars for you. Written in the stars. So, so, you know, yes, everyone out there listening, you know, you're probably a highly sensitive, very caring person who's playing it safe and too humble. Um, you know, take some pride in, in sharing your truth. And if you're claiming it from the heart and the soul, um, it, there's such a thing as, you know, being soulfish or soulful arrogance, I guess we could say. There's, we got to find new language. I know. Uh, but that was so empowering for me. It's like, all right, man, maybe that's exactly it. I need to, I've been so scared about being arrogant. I, I just, it's like, it's just so not about acceptance and approval. And you know this, I mean, you put yourself yeah. out there. I've had people say just terrible things about me, you know, especially from those, you know, kind of. And the human side of us, I mean, I've, the human side of it, us feels that we feel it when we understand it deeper, but we still feel it, but we understand it deeper. And the thing is we have to come into that deeper understanding. That's what this is all about. So it's okay. We can acknowledge that there's another moment where we can say, okay, you know, my little, my little self-conscious, my little insecure one, come here. Let me hold you. I, you know, I'm, I'm in love with you. I'm, I'm welcoming you into my space and just watching how you're being in this moment, knowing that, I'm connected to so much deeper and where this is coming from is such a soul based space. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And that's where I, you know, in the book, I talk about care of the soul and peace within the soul, inner child work, that that inner child, that, that very vulnerable part of us. There's a real relationship to this vulnerability and sharing your gift because it, it, you know, there's a passage in the Bible that says my strength is forged in vulnerability. Mm. So, So it's actually walking this, to the Tibetan Buddhists, the most powerful, indestructible place is this inmost center of the human heart, which is tremendously vulnerable, but it's also like a liquid liquid crystal that is the most intelligent, wise, powerful force in the universe, they say. Mm. But it just also feels incredibly vulnerable. But when you realize that you can't fall any further from that space and there's no there's nothing to defend. There's because from the soul standpoint, there's nothing, there's no place to defend. There's no ego to defend. There's nothing. There's no, um, and that's the beautiful thing about when you're living from that place, which is very similar to also being on your deathbed. You know, it's a deathbed meditation when you realize that what will matter on your deathbed is how light and open your heart is. Mm. And, you know, when you're in that place, um, there is no fear. There is no fear and you're completely vulnerable and you're ready to dissolve into that. You know, the Egyptian book of the dead, your heart would be writ, measured against a feather at death. And if it was as light as a feather, you went to heaven. And if it wasn't, it was devoured mm. and you had to come back and do it again. So, so this idea, this light, open heart, you know, not only light in terms of weight, but light in terms of light. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I love this stuff. I'm so glad you get it. Oh yeah. And we all, we all need to, to really get it, so to speak, you know, and feel it and become it. And you know, this is how we move ourselves forward. This conscious evolution, this great, you know, cosmic intelligence that is just appearing. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so here it is. And, and the way that you bring it into your music, 
the way that you give us this incredible lullaby, you know, this just this way of soothing and opening and inviting. And I would love to invite you to play for us too, so we can really feel into this now. Take all this, this heady talk, you know, and just breathe it into this embodied sense of what it means to feel into the song of our soul. Beautiful. And while I'm doing this, you can, everyone listening and watching can help me play by slowing your breath down. You know, really, I want you to notice how long my out breaths are when I breathe. And I really want you just to do some really deep breathing while I play and really tune into your heart as you hear the music touching your heart, drop out of your head, bathing the heart center with your breath with nice deep breaths as I play. takes me to that other place it is it is such a I don't know, transportation a, you know a way of transporting us it's like into the silence mm. yes yeah. to notice how the quality of silence deepens after the music um and i noticed you know i i came to realize that that little kid hitting that piano those keys it wasn't the sound that I was after. It was this, the quality of the silence after the sound that was healing. That, that's what I was after was that empty, still, vast openness. Absolutely. It's such a pow powerful reminder of who we are on the deepest level. Who we are. But we can access that that feeling, that space, that silence, that, that sacred space within us, anytime, that's always here. You know, that, that, from that space, we live into the world. Amen. We, we discover who we truly are, how we connect with each other. We feel our sense of, of wholeness and home. So beautiful, Michael. Mm, thank you. Well, it's just, uh, it's just an honor to play and share it's no matter how difficult the day has been and i play as soon as just one note on that flute and i'm i'm in a different place and um, yeah. time and space dissolve and uh, and i can i can handle another day on the planet right and all that's left is this moment this everlasting timeless moment past yeah. future, and all of it boom right here boom. yes Thank you so much. 
What a beautiful journey this has been. And, and I know, you know, you have this gift for everybody, the three breaths to de-stress, this 10 yes. minute you know, with PDF. And that is this, what we just experienced, right? Coming into those breaths. And so please, you guys click on that link and have it. Take this gift and use it every day. You know, bring, bring that, bring yourself back to this the beautiful space of being. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you for having me, Val. Just such a delight to be with you. So much fun to hang out and, and share. And we'll have to do this again. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael, for everything you are. Deeply appreciate you. Just a mirror and ditto. God bless you. Namaste.